thanks to all the panelists. That was fantastic. I'm going to uh, share my screen while I introduce uh, our next speaker. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, I'm very excited to introduce uh, Li Wei Hung uh, from the National Park Service. Dr. Li Wei Hung is the lead scientist for the National Park Night Sky Monitoring Team. She provides scientific support to park managers in protecting natural night skies. Her research team is currently developing long-term sky brightness monitoring tools and studying how LED lighting affects sky glow. Dr. Hung is an astrophysicist by training. She received her PhD in astronomy from UCLA. Um, Dr. Hung, we're really excited to have you. I think if I stop sharing here, then we will all be able to see you. Is that right? Is this yeah, hi, good morning, everyone. Hi, good, good morning. morning. Good morning. And you should be able to share your screen when you're ready. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, there it is. You see my PowerPoint slide? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, so hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for um, having me and inviting me to uh, be part of your uh, annual summit. So um, today I'm going to talk about preserving the natural night skies at U.S. national parks and beyond. So why we are interested in um, presenting uh, in preserving the night sky, it is because we see the night skies as a resource. So uh, when you go to a national park, you often think about, you know, the beautiful flora and fauna and the scenic wildlife um, that you experience. We see the night sky as a natural resource as well, because if you truly go to a place that is truly in the wilderness, you will have uh, the night skies without the intrusion of light pollution. Um, so for us, night sky is natural resources. It is also a cultural resource. Um, this is, I, I think it is a really cool idea, you know, because like the sky we see right now, like the same stars are pretty much the, all the stars are pretty much the same as what our ancestors see, like in hundreds or thousands of years ago. And then in fact, in a lot of um, uh, historical parks, you can see the, the historical buildings built by you know people with their like hundreds or thousands of years ago, they use the night nice sky's features as the orientation of um, how they oriented the buildings and how they uh, align their their religious beliefs and also like the construction of the society to the heaven. It is an also an educational resource. Um, so you can see the pictures um, in my slide background. I took that picture when I was a high school student. Um, it was like an inspiring experience uh, to draw me into science. I remember one of my professors said there are two things that you can draw students into science. One is dinosaurs and the other one is nice guys. And last one uh, is the economic resource because when you um, look at the recent development of the recreational opportunities, there are more and more astrotourisms um, that are becoming popular. And for people who come to the nice guys events, they usually need to stay in the local area overnight. So that also include, uh, increase the economic uh, benefits of the local communities. For our National Park Service, um, give me a second, let me see if I can move this bar out of the way, there you go. That's better. Okay. Um, for our National Park Service, we have a management policy specific dedicated to lightscape management. So it says that we will preserve to the greatest extent possible the natural lightscapes of parks, which are natural resource and value that exists in the absence of human caused light. And we want to do this um, so that um, we can keep this resource for the generations to come. So when I talk about national parks, uh, a lot of people have uh, pop up 
have the images or names pop out in their mind, including like the very big ones like Grand Canyon, Yellowstone, um, Yosemite, etc. So all of those are national parks, that's right. But in fact, we have a total of 420 national park units in the United States. So this includes not just the national parks, but also the national monuments, national historical park, national river, um, uh, national cultural uh, historical sites, national preserve, etc. In our organization structures, at the bottom is our individual parks. And above that, we have 12 regions. Um, we divided all the, the, all the parts, separate all the parts into 12 regions. And on top of that, we have Washington Support Office. And my division, the Natural Sounds and Nice Guys, belongs to the Washington Support Office. That being said, I don't belong to a specific park in particular. Uh, instead, whenever a park uh, in the national park system has any uh, questions, concerns, needs advice about nice guys, they are welcome to call our office and we can provide technical supports to all the parks. Our office is located in Fort Collins, Colorado. And again, we provide uh, technical supports to all 400 uh, MPS park units. So here is our camera system. How do we measure the night sky's brightness? So this is what we use. Here is a picture. You can see uh, we have a lens that's just a commercial Nikon, Nikon lens. The um, actually imaging detector is a CCD camera. Uh, in the middle is a filter wheel we, where we can put in a specific, specific filter. For example, we have V-band that will only let visible light passes through. So um, what we detect in the picture will be really similar to what human eyes can see. And then we have a, a robotic arm. It's hooked up by batteries. And what's not shown here is a, a, a computer that we use to control the robotic arm. So this system, when it takes one picture, you will see uh, it doesn't cover the entire sky. So this on the right is an example of the picture that it took. It's 24 degrees by 24 degrees. To put this in perspective, if the moon would have been captured in this image, the size of the moon would be um, like the red dot showing on the upper left hand corner. Um, so it's pretty wide field view, but it doesn't cover the entire sky. Here shows a video of uh, my colleague Sherilyn Anderson and I setting up the equipment in the field. So first is the tripod and then the cameras and then we hook it up with a computer and set the program to run. And it takes about one to two hours to set it up and to calibrate the position. So because like what I said, each image only covers a, a particular portion of the sky. We actually use this system to take 45 images so that we can cover the entire sky. So what I drawn here is uh, imagine this is the, the entire sky you are seeing. The zenith, which is right overhead, is in the center of the circle and the horizon is along the, uh, the edge of the circle. To do this, we first take 15 images along the horizon and then another 15 at a little bit higher up elevation and then 10 and final five overhead. And here is an example of, um, of our image products. So after we collect these data sets, we calibrate them uh, in the office and we puzzle them, we mosaic them together, mosaic those 45 images together. So on the top, you can see is uh, basically the product direct, directly out from our camera. So uh, we put those 45 images to form a panoramic view. So from the bottom, the bottom is the horizon, the top is the zenith, which is right overhead. And you can see it goes from northeast, southwest, back to north again. And we are able to uh, measure the sky brightness with uh, the real physical brightness unit. So instead 
of relative brightness, we can calibrate it to uh, the, the physical brightness units, which is in magnitude per square arc second. And uh, the color bar is shown on the top right there. Under this color scheme, the natural sky would appear purple. Of course, this is false color, so uh, the actual night sky doesn't look like this, but uh, under our color scheme, the natural sky would appear purple or dark blue. And the brightest part of the Milky Way would appear uh, bright green or slightly yellow. And you can see the Milky Way. You can see my mouse right here. This is the Milky Way. It runs from north to south. And the south Milky Way is more apparent because it's looking at the center of our galaxy. Um, along the horizon, you can see some light domes. And on the second image, we are able to take out the natural light component. It is, this is because in the observed sky, we observe both the natural light and the artificial light. So we, uh, there's a way for us to model the Milky Way position the zodiacal light, which is a scatter sunlight, air glow, which is also a kind of natural light that the air is glowing at night, and uh, also the, uh, the scatter atmosphere scatter light. Once we take out all those natural light, what's left over is in this bottom image. So all, all the light you're seeing in the bottom are artificial light. So they are the lights from the nearby population centers or nearby light sources. So in here, this data set was taken at Chaco Culture National Historical Park. It is in New Mexico. So our program started uh, in the early 2000s and we have collected data from more than 126 national park units. And these are the, the locations that our program, our office, uh, mostly my colleagues have been to. So there are a couple places that I took our camera system and collected the data in Texas. So this is one of them. Uh, this is in San Antonio, uh, La Rancho de las Cabras. It is not the, um, it, it, is, it is not the meant mission of San Antonio, but it's one of their site units. So in there, um, the National Park uh, staff there was concerned about the light pollution and also they want to preserve the natural night, night sky. So they asked us to come down to take a measurement to document the current condition and this is what it looks like. So you can see um, compared to the first image I show you in New Mexico, this place is a lot brighter. So again, on the top is the, uh, every, all the observed light, including natural and anthropogenic. In the bottom, it is just the anthropogenic. We also list the nearby cities that, um, that our model, that will have a model impact in the site. So listed by their, uh, the amount of impact they would produce. It is modeled based on their population size in the distance. So uh, in this case, the big light dome you're seeing here is mostly from San Antonio and also a little bit from uh, Floresville as well. There's another place I've been in Texas that's a big thicket, National Preserve, and uh, they have a lot of trees and it was kind of challenging because we usually try to find a clear place to uh, take the pictures of the sky. And here's what we are able to get. And again, here are the nearby cities that are likely to contribute to the uh, light, light domes that can be seen in the image, that including Houston, Beaumont, and etc. With this image, we can extract some useful metrics of the night sky brightness, and then we can keep tracking these metrics to see how they change. Next, I want to talk about, um, touch upon a short example project that we are recently doing. So we're recently doing a case study of how the changing of the street lights will affect the, the light pollution, specifically the sky glow. 
So there is a county in the Washington state, it's Chilean County. The county is changing all of their county-owned streetlights, which uh, involves about a total of 4,000 4, streetlights. Uh, so their original streetlights is the high-pressure sodium lamp. Their new lights are LEDs. And this transition is very popular. There are a lot of cities that are replacing their old streetlights with LEDs. And here shows a map of where the county is. It's about three hours uh, east of Seattle, also about three hours west of Spokane, sort of in the middle. And um, each purple dot represents a light, a street light. What we have found is that um, before they retrofit their street lights, this is the image we got is on the top that um, we are on a little hill overlooking the largest population center in the county is Wenatchee. And um, you can see you can see the light dome of Wenatchee is right here. And then uh, the Milky Way, you can kind of trace it out laying right here. So Wenatchee, I, when I first went there, I wasn't very familiar with the town, but I quickly found out that's where my apples come from. So that's just an interesting side story. Um, yeah, and then this is the after image. It's so after they replaced with most 3000 Kelvin LEDs. You can see the light dome became bigger, extended higher to the sky. So with this case study, it shows that a typical um, high pressure sodium light to LED transition will likely increase the brightness of the night sky. So this is a very active area of research. Like we don't know exactly what kind of light can, you know, like can really bring the light pollution down versus what kind of light with shielding, with more targeted uh, lighting directions. Like will they be able to bring down the light pollution or will they be just brighter and in just in the end send out more photons in the sky? So this is an active area of research. We are trying to find what are the suitable replacement that can um, for the street lights that can that can offer a good benefits for the community, but also keep the sky natural. And recently, our our division, um, specifically in the National Park Service, is working with Illuminating Engineering Society. So for people who are not that familiar with IES, um, IES is the industry-backed, not-for-profit society uh, with members mostly composed of people in the lighting industry. So it listed right here, but uh, it's mostly, you know, those lighting engineers, those lighting manufacturers is really the people that is are active in the lighting industry and the, that design lights, install lights, and plan for the city lighting, for example. So we are working with them to create outdoor lighting standards and gui guidelines that are more suitable for the park settings um, because we understand a lot of standard lighting policies, like they usually are more geared toward, for example, city lighting, residentials, et cetera. So we are working with them to create a, a suite that is more suitable for protected areas. Here's are some um, simple overall big guidelines I can share with everyone about what are sustainable lighting. So in dealing with like light pollution, we don't we don't tell people, we don't tell people just turn off your light, right? Because that is radical. That is not um, practical because there, there are times that we do need lights to at night to make sure that we can move around outside safely and get the illumination, illumination levels that are needed. So while understanding that, the things that we are advocating are for responsible outdoor lighting. Uh, what that means is that it has these five big principles. Uh, first of all, when you go out and you look at the light, uh, instead of evaluating oh, whether it's a good light or bad light, you maybe for first question you should think is, is it useful? Is it needed? Do we need a light there? So there's no one there, you know, for the 
on the on the sidewalk that no one would ever go because there's a gate is always closed like do we need the light there for example so if we do make sure the light is targeted to where it needs it doesn't spill to other areas or to the nearby trees and for example and uh, use the low light levels that just uh, good enough for to achieve the task or the level that you want to illuminate don't over illuminate uh, control that is very important because maybe not all the places need to be lit at three o'clock in the morning so also think about timing of when the light is needed and finally color so color is the color of light usually you will see um, on the package, especially for LEDs, that it will say is 3,000 Kelvin or 4,000 Kelvin or 5,000 Kelvin, for example. And with the number, as the number goes up, it becomes more white. So we advocate for using the lower numbers. So for example, 3,000 Kelvin or even better, uh, 2,700 Kelvin. That are the warm, warm yellow light that are um, familiar to the night sky and to the human night vision that uh, we won't be able, we won't get knocked out of the dark adapted regime as, as badly as the bright white light. And finally, um, I just want to share with some of the pictures I took while I was in the field trip at many different places. So these are the reason that inspired me to, um, for me to do what I'm doing. Or to conclude this talk, I really think this preservation effort, it is a inter interdisciplinary work that requires science, working between scientists, um, advocacy groups, individuals, and uh, city planners, land managers, lighting engineers, lighting manufacturers, for example, to all work together in order to make this preservation effort effective. And thank you very much for all um, being here and being part of this and um, spread the word and share, share our concerns. And I hope that we can keep working on this effort because, well, light pollution is the kind of pollution that is, how do I say, maybe easiest to fix in the sense that if you turn off the light, then the light pollution is gone. However, like the damage that it has done, the impact it has made to wildlife or even to human experience that we might not ever be able to get it back to what it was. So um, I'll just leave that words with you and thank you for all uh, being concerned and working in this field. Thank you so much, Li Wei. That was fantastic. Really appreciate you sharing that perspective from the National Park Service. I have some questions. Uh, of my own, but I see that we also have some audience questions. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Leah to, to read us some of those. Go ahead, Leah. Yeah, we just had a bunch of questions all come in at once. Um, and kind of speaking to what you just ended on, a note about collaboration. Um, one question regards outdoor security lighting. Um, they say outdoor security lighting industry is booming along with surveillance cameras. Is there any kind of collaborative initiative in the works on that front? Uh, yeah, so there are a lot of um, outdoor lighting guidance, and that's one of the area that we are working on specifically. Um, specifically about security lighting, we didn't we didn't like divide down into that detail just for security lighting. But um, uh, right now, what I can offer is just the general principle. Like maybe sometimes we need to work in with the law enforcement because I know a lot of times I hear they have different concerns about, you know, whether in the emergency situation, whether you can identify the color of the car, whether you can see the license plate clearly and stuff like that. So maybe working with them to see what's their concern so that we can best address the, the lighting needs specific targeted to, to what was um, being, being concerned about. Awesome. Um, another question that we have kind of has to do with um, some public access here. So is the public able to access the night sky photos from the data that you and your team have collected, especially the ones that show Texas parks? Uh, yes. So yes, uh, 
currently on our website, um, they, there is a link. So I'll try best to do this. Maybe I can send you an email afterwards or, or something or posting a, a Q&A later. Um, so if you go to our Natural Sounds and Nice Guys website, of the National Park Service, you will see on the Nice Guys um, portion that there's a, a data that we share with the data that we collected. Um, we need to do some updates on this because like, um, we didn't have the most updated data in the recent years, but our updates should come out soon. Uh, but currently there's, there's an archive um, data uh, right now. But with the most recent years that uh, the updates will be coming soon. And my colleagues is working on that. So hopefully it will be available soon. Awesome. Well, speaking of Texas parks, uh, the LBJ National Historical Park is applying for an IDA, International Dark Sky Association designation. Um, are they able to work with you to get sophisticated measurements here in the Hill Country? Uh, the answer is yes. And uh, so the, the parks, the, I, from what I'm, my understanding is the, the IDA, the kind of requirement, the measurement they require, it does not require um, the panoramic image that I show. I think it requires the, some zenith uh, brightness measurements that you can achieve with a simple SQM. Um, however, if there's a, if there's a need, need, sometimes the park will, will, would like our assistance with um, doing some nice guys brightness measurements, especially just to go through like what are different numbers means or um, what is this, uh, how to use this device, etc. cetera. So um, yeah, send us a message and then we'll see where where we can find help with that. Awesome, thank you. Um, I think we've got time for maybe two more questions. So this one is kind of on a similar note in terms of collaborating with you all. Um, does the Night Sky and Natural Sound Division work with the local gateway communities around national parks to update lighting infrastructure and help keep the night sky dark around the parks? Uh, okay, this is a very good question because you know, like light pollution is not a local issue. So it's like more like a regional global issue, like light just comes on. You can see lights as far as like a hundred miles away, for example. So um, that's a very good question. Our division is trying to work with some local communities. However, most, our division mostly provides technical supports and usually it's the local parks that takes that first uh, step in the initiative. So like, for example, like the park near me, uh, Rocky Mountain National Park, if they're concerned, like usually they take the first step to work with the community and we can come in as um, to provide more technical support if they need to um, talk about like the nice guys, the measurements or the concerns and we are, we are able to support them. So we play more of a supportive role instead of the initiate, initiating an organizational role. Awesome. Thank you for clarifying that. And then one last question, um, and this one is specific to one of the slides you showed. From the data that you showed, it appears that the Washington County LED lights had greater lumens than the lights they replaced. Did the county intend for this to be a dark sky friendly replacement or just an energy cost saver? So the, the uh, county staff were actually very dark sky aware, so they actually hope that this would uh, bring down the overall light pollution. And that's our hope as well. Like before we did this study, we actually didn't, didn't know that, oh, this would definitely be brighter, or this would definitely be darker. So it was actually an exploratory study as well, for us as well. And um, the actual lumen output for the new lights, interestingly, interestingly is lower than the original light. So original light is high pressure sodium lamps. It's usually about 20,000 lumen. Um, the new light, new LED is about 10,000 lumen. So it's about half. However, like maybe it's because uh, the spectra is a little bit different. So the new lights are bluer and therefore it more light gets into the sky in that sense and scatters more. So the exact cause of what causes a, a night sky to become brighter is hard to say. Also the LEDs are more targeted and they are more fully shielded. So in that aspect, it should be better. Um, however, what we observe is still, the night sky is still getting brighter. So uh, we advocate that you should either um, go down even to a lower brightness level or uh, using even warmer lamps, which is uh, instead of 3000K, use uh, 2700K. Awesome. 
Thank you. We are at our time. There were some incredible questions. So if, if you have the chance to type back an answer, that would be incredible. And I'm sure folks would appreciate it. But I know Cliff is going to have to switch us to our, our next presentation. Yeah, sure. I will check the Q&A. Thank, Thank you for your invitation. Thank you so much, Dr. Hung. I would like to listen to the Night Sky questions for, uh, for a while more, but we can't do that. Uh, so uh, I will turn it over to 